Hey, Anchor Church, we are so glad that you're joining us for worship this week. It's Valentine's week. We hope you all have a great Valentine's day, a Valentine's week, whenever you're watching this service. We're going to get going in less than a minute, so you better have your coffee already ready. We'll see you. Hey, good morning, Anchor family. We're so excited to be with you today on Valentine's Day. What a great day. We get to talk today about the God of love. We get to talk about love in general. Uh, you know, we have this, this holiday that we, we celebrate that's a secular holiday, but what a great thing for us to do as the church, those who know that our God is love, to talk about love on this day. Uh, you know, this is a topic that's so prevalent in the Bible that literally we could take three to six months to talk about it, and we still wouldn't exhaust all the depth of knowledge that is in the Bible as we talk about love, specifically because, again, our God is love, isn't he? What a great thing to talk about today. Uh, we're going to focus on that. We're also going to talk about so many different aspects of love. We're going to try to cram so much into this one message, but we want to just get right into it today. Uh, most of us know, I think, right off the bat, that love is a strong emotion, isn't it? There's a lot of emotions out there that really run through us that can drive us different ways, but love out of all emotions has got to be one of the strongest, if not the strongest, because of the way that it impacts us. It changes how we think. It changes how we act. You know, that, that uh, emotion of love can make us compromise on things. You know, it can make us change our values. It can make us chase things we're not supposed to. It can make us act irrationally. You know, I remember one time just stupidly because I was trying to date a girl at the time, uh, long before I was married and before I was a Christian. I actually, I quit a job to go snowboarding with a girl one day. And it didn't pan out, obviously. <laughs> I'm not married to her. I'm married to a great woman. Uh, but, you know, love makes us do stupid things sometimes. It can make us act irrationally. It can make us compromise our standards. It can make us compromise our beliefs and our commitments. Uh, it can sway us a lot of different ways. But, you know, there's so many great things that come with it, too, when it's put in its right context. And we look at some of that today uh, just as reminders to find out that, you know, that love is powerful. Love is powerful. Uh, we see it everywhere. It can, it can lift us up. It can destroy us to the brink of wanting to take our own life. It can make the world seem like nothing can be wrong. And just the lack of it from a certain person can transform everything and how we think about it. Love is everywhere in our culture, in our minds, in society, in, in Christ, of course, in the church. Uh, we see it out in society in love songs. You know, we hear songs all the time like, love is all you need. Can't buy me love. Uh, my love don't cost a thing. There's, there's love poetry like roses are red, violets are blue, fill in the blank. Uh, there's love stories like Romeo and Juliet. It seems that every single movie that comes out, the one is there's a horror movie, there's an action movie, then there's a love story. Disney seems to make every other movie about a love story. And why? Because we love love stories. We like the sappy ones. We like to see people be together. We like to see regeneration or a re restoration of broken families and things like that. We love to see love. We even today, you know, we have a whole day of love. We're, it's what kind of what we're celebrating today. Uh, Valentine's Day is so popular in, in the world that you know that it, when I was working as a server at Macaroni Grill for a part-time, uh, I had an easier time getting off around Christmas than I did around Valentine's Day because so many people go around that. Uh, it's special to Walmart, it's special to Target because they're selling candy hearts before Christmas is even over. They're trying to make money off this day of love. There's no denying that we love love. In fact, you know, people, some, some people put that as their sole focus in life. They love a person or a thing or a job and they give everything they have to it until they don't love it anymore. You know, Jesus agrees that love is number one in life. In fact, that's what he told us, that we're supposed to love God and love others. That's the number one thing in life. As a matter of fact, we got a lot of notes to take today. So if you're note takers, write these things down. The first thing I want you to know as we talk about love, that my life, this is a personal thing here, my life should be based on love. Your life ought to be based on love, loving God, loving others. That's what Luke 10, 27 says. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. Now in the Bible, 348 times the word love appears. 
And I don't know about you guys, but when someone says something to me 348 times, I think they want my attention, right? I, want, I ought to be paying attention to this. So that's some of the things we ought to explore today. And we're going to start with four quick facts. Before we jump into the whole thing here, we want to start with four quick facts. And if you follow along in the YouVersion app, uh, you can check these out with us here. The first one is without God, there is no love. Without God, there is no love. 1 John 4, 8 tells us God is love. It even tells us that we are not able to love without God. 1 John 4, 19 says we love because he first loved us. Without God's love towards us, without God's love in the world as God, the source of love, we would not love. Now, I'm not saying that if you're not a Christian, you can't love. Of course you can love. You can love family. You can love friends. There's, of course there is love there. But love does not exist in its proper context. And without God himself, there would be no love. We would not be able to experience this. Without God, love would look much different. You know, he is the standard of love. He's the standard of love. He defines it. He demonstrates. We're going to discuss more in detail today as we walk through this sermon, but we're going to find out that God is love, but not in the way that the world thinks that God is. I'm not going to jump too much into this, but just in my study, just briefly to share with you, as, as you walk through the Greek context of this, it shows that God is the definite article, meaning that God is love, but it would be wrong to say that love is God. God himself is love. He is the, he defines it, he demonstrates it, he is the standard of it. And also, we should note that, you know, because Jesus is God made flesh, he's God incarnate, and God is love, that means Jesus was the very personification of love. When God came to earth in the form of Christ, when Christ was incarnate here, walking on the earth with us, he was the very embodiment of love as he walked around here. So that's the first thing to know, is without God, there's no love. Second thing to know is that love sums up everything that God has ever required of you. It sums up everything that God has ever required of you. Look at this story here in Matthew chapter 22. Verse 36 says, Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? Jesus responded to him saying, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You should love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and all the prophets. Everything that we've ever heard, everything that God has taught us has been summed up in this, that we ought to love God and we ought to love others. So without God, there is no love. Love sums up everything God has required of us. Third thing, love is supposed to be, it ought to be, the defining feature of your life. You know, people are known for a lot of different things. You know, baseball players might be known as being great baseball players. Maybe you know a mom who is just knocking out of the park. She's number one mom. She's, she's just killing it for the kids. You know, she, we know uh, certain people uh, pursue um, so many different things, you know. We, we go after stuff. We're, named, we're known for a lot of different things, habits, hobbies, stuff like that. Love ought to be the defining feature of your life. If you're a Christian, the thing you ought to be known for most is love. You know, this is, this is our golden arches. This is our brand. This is, this is the Nike swoosh. This is the little blue Twitter bird. This is how people know who we are. Our brand is love. What do we look like? When people look at us, they ought to see love coming through there. That's what John uh, told us in John chapter 13. Jesus was speaking. He said, by this, all men will know that you're my disciples. How? Because you're religious. Because you go and do all these nice things all the time. He says, the world is going to recognize that you belong to Christ by the love that you show. By the love that you show. You know, 1 John goes on to tell us in multiple times and multiple ways that, you know, your Christian faith could be called into question if you don't love. Because it's something we ought to constantly be growing in. 1 John 4, 8 says, Whoever doesn't love doesn't know God because God is love. If we have truly been saved by Christ, if we spend time in his word, if we're growing in him, just being around him through his Holy Spirit, we are naturally transferred more towards loving. So can I say gently, but with the, the conviction of a pastor to you, if you see that you don't love, if you're not growing in love, you need to check where you are with Christ. Because we ought to always be growing in this. There's no standard of how much you should love except that you ought to love and you ought to continue to be growing in that love. And the fourth thing to know, everyone wants to be loved. I think you knew that already. Everybody wants to be loved, no matter who you are, whether whether you're you're the the stay-at-home mom or whether you're in the biker gang. We all want to be loved, right? And that can look different in in a lot of different ways, you know? Someone might be looking for the love or the approval of a parent. You know, maybe you want a close connection with a friendship from someone. Maybe you want that kind of close, clingy, romantic relationship where you've got to hold hands all the time. You've got to put your hands on their shoulder and doing the things that make everyone else around you kind of uncomfortable sometimes. Don't do that. But you may be looking for that kind of relationship. You know, you want that kind of connection. We all want love. You know, this desire comes from God's creative design. 
Whether or not you're a Christian, God has put something into the human spirit that wants to love and is designed to connect with the Father. That love that is there is meant to connect with Him. There's closeness that is there. Every single person that was ever created was designed to connect with God in that way, to have that relationship with Him. There's closeness with Him. But that's not where it stops. You know, we, we think often just about love as an emotion, but do you know that love completely and totally impacts us psychologically as well? There's some, some great studies out there. I found a, a detailed one that shows that love is a very, very strong force in life. There was a study that was conducted to determine the effect of love on the brain. To see, they, they put monitors on, they do it, however they do it, they put it on the person's head, and they had this person show them images and various studies that they did, and they came to the conclusion that love is much more than a feeling or even a state of mind because of the power that love has on you as a person. They talk about in their studies here, uh, emotionally involves, if you're in love, thinking about your crush up to 85% of your waking time. Stalker much? That seems like a long time to be thinking about someone constantly like that. You know, it also talks about how physical effects appear. This emotion, something that's completely intangible. I mean, we can't touch or see love, right? We, we can see it manifested. But we cannot touch or see love, but we know that love impacts the body. We see it in things like the loss of appetite occurs. You ever done that before? Remember maybe in junior high or something like that, you see that person like, oh man, I'm, I'm just so nervous now. Maybe uh, you get your heart rate rises, you know, your heart starts pumping. You want to go ask that guy or that girl out, your heart starts pumping. These are scientific facts that they have been able to study. Another thing they point out in that study is that intestinal activity increases. And what that means, it doesn't mean you're just getting gassy. What it means is there is legitimate scientific evidence to say there's a reason why you feel butterflies in your stomach. There is legitimate scientific evidence behind that because love does that to us. You know, to take it even a step further, the same study discovered that when a person is in love, a piece of your brain actually shuts off. But it just turns off, like flipping a light switch. You stop acting this way. There's a part of your brain that deactivates, and that's what allows these parts of your body, to these bodily effects, to happen. You start getting it, your heart starts rising, you get really nervous around them. That's a transformative thing of love affecting you. Now, if the Bible talks about it 348 times, if we can see that cognitive thought, actions, and bodily functions can be affected by love, and we can observe this in science, it stands to reason that love is much more than emotional. Isn't it? You don't just feel love. Journey would tell us it's more than a feeling. Right? Is that who said Journey, Kansas? I don't know. I don't know those old bands. Somebody said, it's more than a feeling. I know you sang that with me. It's more than a feeling. There's so much more to it than just that small thing. But today, I don't want to just talk about romantic love because in the Christian sphere of influence and everything that we do in life, love impacts everywhere that we go. It impacts my relationship with my wife, of course, the romantic love there, but it also impacts my relationships with my kids, with my friends, with fellow pastors who I work with with those who I work with out in the world, with those I interact with. Love goes out everywhere in the life of the Christian. And so we're not going to just explore just romantic love. We're going to look at the full scope of love. And you know, it's actually, I think it's very handy that we had the Bible written to us in Greek as opposed to English because the Greek language actually uses four different words to describe love for us. Four different ways. So it's very clear. It's very focused. When they say, I have this kind of love, we know what they're talking about. The, the English language is kind of limited. You know, I mean, for instance, if I was trying to explain to you my, my undying devotion and care for my wife. I mean, I love my wife more than anything in the world, right? I mean, I would jump in front of a plane, in front of a train for it at, without thinking about it twice. I would rescue her, I would save her, I would help her because I love her, I care for her. She is, she is one of the reasons I'm alive, right? I mean, we are united in spirit because of God. And the word I use to describe that is love, right? But we're kind of limited in that because that's the same word I've got to use if I say I really like fries. My undying devotion, my like for my wife, and my like for fries have to have the same word, but the Greeks don't do that. They've got four different words for it. For instance, when uh, the Greek word is talking, if it wants to say love or affection, like if you love a puppy, it would use the Greek word storge. They would say storge. I storge that puppy. What a cute little puppy, right? If it was trying to explain erotic love or, or uh, uh, sexual love, it would say eros, which is erotic love. You know, this is uh, just because we're there. The Bible tells us there's only one way that erotic love is accepted and blessed by God, and that's in the covenant of marriage between one man and one woman with God, having walked through there. But what is presented in the world today, nine times out of ten, what we see in normal culture and movies is we see this eros love, this romantic love, sexual love, presented as the end, the end all of love. 
Like when people get together, that when they come together sexually, oh man, we must be completely in love, and that's just ridiculous. We see so many different problems in that. Love has been perverted in society to include anything and everything that people want at the expense of what God has said and made very clear. Things that God has forbidden as are, are taken now as the norm. Society grabs whatever they want and they totally pervert it. It goes against the Lord in so many different ways. That's why every single comedy show plot centers around some kind of sexual activity or sexual exploit. Why the main characters are constantly going after, we see just everywhere in culture. That, that's eros, that's sexual love. And again, there's a place for that. There's a good place for that inside the marriage bed. If you wanted to talk about brotherly love or familial love, you know, that you have for your father or your parents, uh, we would say phileo. That's why the Greek, where, uh, where we get the word Philadelphia, the city of Philadelphia is known as the city of brotherly love. And then if you're a Christian, you would probably recognize this word. You've probably heard it before. The Greek word agape, which we usually break down to just mean unconditional love. And that's, that's an absolutely accurate description of it. But I don't think it gives the full breadth of it. You see, because agape is the kind of love that is unconditional, no matter what goes on there. Agape cares, it still loves, it still sacrifices. Agape love holds emotion, it feels emotion, but it's not based on it. It feels emotion, it feels the love, that strong care that we would say, like I have agape love for my wife. I, oh, I feel that love for my wife. Sometimes I don't feel that love, but I know that love is there. It's not based on it. This is a chosen love. This is a love that will never ever be discontinued. And that is the kind of love that Christ has for us. That's the kind of love that Christ has for us. This is the kind of love that God expects us to have for others. He expects us to copy this kind of love, and we see that in places like 1 Corinthians 13, chapter, uh, chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. Uh, so if you have your Bibles handy, turn over there. Most of you know this. This is the chapter or the, the verses we call on love, right? You've probably heard them uh, at a wedding. Maybe you've heard it on Valentine's Day before. Uh, hopefully you know that in the context, while these words are absolutely true in and of themselves, they're written in the context of ministering in the church. These are written and when we're talking about spiritual gifts. Can I speak in tongues? Can I prophesy? Can I teach? Can I show discernment when you do those things? But can you do it without love? No. Paul's talking about in spiritual gifts. That's the context here. But again, we can pull these things out. We can see that this is what love really looks like. This is what Christ really looks like with this. So let's read these together. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7 says this. It says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. That's the kind of love that God has for his people. This kind of love is a chosen love. It's one that does not give up. It's one that says when trials and hard times come, it continues. In the face of adversity, love doesn't give up. When you have a trial in your marriage, you don't say we're running to divorce. You say we're going to fight. We're going to stick to this. We're going to work through it. In a friendship, it yields out of grace and care for the other person. With children, it's being patient with them as they learn. Love is manifested in a lot of different ways, but what we do know is that love fights for love. Love fights for love. And this kind of love, this agape love, is the kind of love that is primarily seen in the Bible. 145 times that word occurs in the New Testament and is used almost exclusively, with very few exceptions, almost exclusively as it speaks about the love a Christian should have in the world for God and for the things of God. 145 times we are commanded as the people of God that this is the kind of love we ought to show. So how do we get that love? How do we, uh, how do we show that love you know, if we want to love like Jesus, we've got to look at these things here. We can see that Jesus manifested all these things. Maybe you've walked through a study like this before where you took these verses and you thought, man, what does love look like? Well, we know that God is love and Jesus is love. So we could put Jesus in there. We could say Jesus is patient and kind, couldn't we? Jesus is patient and kind. Jesus doesn't envy or boast. I don't know that I could say that about me. I don't know that I could. Carl is not arrogant or rude. Because Carl gets hangry sometimes. Carl makes stupid mistakes. But Jesus certainly does not assist on his own way. He's not irritable or resentful. That's, that's not love. How do we get that love? We should pursue that love. And the Bible says how we can do that. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, tells us quite a few different things about love. And I want you to notice these. Maybe take notes on these. First thing is it says that love is two things. It says it is two things. It says it's patient and it's kind. But right after that, it clarifies love is not 
eight different things. Love is not envious, boastful, arrogant, rude, insistent on its own way. It's not irritable, resentful, or happy with wrongdoing. Can I tell you, if you're practicing any of those in any context, you are not demonstrating love. And love does four things. It bears, it believes, it hopes, it endures. It does a lot of different stuff. You know, these, these principles are often looked at and we, we, we kind of gloss over them. We don't dig into them, all the, the, the minutiae that should be there. Their meaning is much deeper than the surface. So for the practical application of what we look at today, I'm going to give you nine different ways, nine different ways to grow in your love. Nine different ways to grow in love. And all of these come to specifically from <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 13. <clears throat> so the first thing we start with, if you're just reading right along with us, first thing to do, if you want to grow in love, practice patience. Practice patience. It's interesting that one of the hardest things for us to do in life is at the top of the list of love. Did you notice that? Because I sure did. One of the hardest things we do as people is to be patient. So you know, essentially, if you're saying, I can't be patient, you're essentially saying, I can't love. We've got to learn how to grow in this. With, with that focus, we think we ought to invest our efforts into growing in this here. We gotta dig in more into that. We wanna put our efforts into learning patience, shouldn't we? If that's how we demonstrate love, we gotta grow in that. Patience displays many, many different things, one of which is the ability to take your eyes off yourself. The ability to take your eyes off yourself. You know, the, the original meaning of this here, of this word, is long suffering, which basically breaks down to the capacity to be wronged, but to not retaliate. Long-suffering, being patient with those. Uh, maybe you know already, patience is learned and must be practiced. It's not something you just get. You're never likely going to get to a pace of patience and just being a patient person without learning it. You know, and if you pray for it, which you should pray for, you're going to find that God will deliver that to you via traffic jam, via child that needs the same thing over and over and over again, or you have a tedious project at school. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Be completely humble, be gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. So the first thing to do, we want to practice patience. You want to grow in your love, practice patience. Second thing, commit to kindness. Commit to kindness. I don't just be, be kind. Commit to it. Be the one who's going to say, no matter what happens, by God's grace, I'm going to practice kindness towards people. This this seems like a no-brainer, doesn't it? To me, it seems like a no-brainer. We ought to just be kind to people. Maybe that's what's just instilled in me as kids or just being polite because I watch Sesame Street, but we ought to commit to kindness in that. But it needs to be said because sometimes we forget it. Sometimes we forget it. You know, sometimes when, again, I mentioned earlier, when I'm hangry, I say a coarse word to my wife, which I should not be doing. I love her like no other, but sometimes I'm rude. Sometimes I'm selfish, but I should commit to kindness especially when we see what the word means here. It's the word posteomai. It appears only here in the Bible, just this one time. It means kind, of course, but it means to show oneself mild, demonstrating that you are that. Kindness appears as something that is seen. You know, thinking good thoughts about someone, that, that's all well and good, that's nice, but it doesn't demonstrate kindness. Demonstrating kindness is the truest kindness. Kindness that is seen is the truest kindness. This word means that love is a verb. Love is a verb. 1 John 3.18 says, Let us not merely say that we love each other. Let us show it, right? Let us show the truth by our actions. So commit to kindness. Practice patience. These are things that we have to grow in so much because, again, as I mentioned earlier, it means taking our eyes off of ourselves. Taking our eyes off of ourselves. Those two prep or walk right into this big one here. Uh, let go of jealousy. If you want to grow in love, then let go of jealousy. Stop trying to hang on to past hurts, wrongs, misunderstandings, things that maybe you shouldn't even be grabbing in the first place. You know, I mean, in contrast to having to learn patience or kindness, jealousy doesn't need to, doesn't seem like it needs to be learned. Uh, maybe if you have kids, more, more than one child, you realize that when you had the first kid, they had all the attention, and then the second kid came in, what does the first child want? all that attention again. So they try to push the baby out of the way. They try to climb up on mom or dad's lap again, right? They take the toy from the other kid. That's jealousy. And we didn't teach the kids that. They just had it naturally in themselves. Jealousy is rooted in selfishness. That hits home with me. Not because I'm necessarily a jealous person, but jealousy at the forefront just really 
makes it plain, jealousy is rooted in selfishness. Jealousy and envy are both completely selfish. They are completely self-centered. This is why jealousy destroys so many relationships. Jealousy is a destructive thing. Uh, I heard a, a story a while ago. It was an old fable that was a, an eagle. And he was, he was the second fastest eagle flying around. And he saw this, the number one you know, flying through the sky one day. So he went down and told a hunter, uh, hey, if you can shoot down that eagle, man, it would be the greatest thing in the world. I'll, I'll pay you somehow. He says, well, I'll tell you what, I've got the arrows here, but I don't have the feather to shoot it to make it go straight, so give me a feather. So sure enough, he pulls off a feather, hands it to him, and he shoots, and he says, oh, man, it didn't go far enough. It went close, but it didn't get him all the way. I need another feather. So he goes through this, gives him another feather. Still, this other eagle's just too far off. He keeps pulling these feathers off until finally that hunter turns the arrow on himself, on the, on the other guy, and kills him. It wasn't the hunter's arrow that took that eagle out. It was his jealousy that hated that other one. That's what was toxic to him. Proverbs 14.30 tells us that a peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. But jealousy is like cancer in the bones. Jealousy is toxic to us. So if you want to grow in your love, you've got to let go of jealousy. I don't know what you're hanging on to. I don't know if the other person caused a legitimate problem in the relationship. I don't know if, you, if you're jealous for some for other reasons. But what I do know is that jealousy is toxic to us. And we've got to let it go. The next one kind of builds right on top of that. We've got to lose our ego. We've got to lose our ego. We've got to get rid of selfishness. The Bible says here, it's not arrogant. Love is not rude. Love does not insist on its own way. We've got to let go of our ego. When we're talking about love, you know, uh, people are always talking about, uh, concerned about getting love. Many forget that love is a sacrificial thing. That we don't just get it, we get to give it. One of the blessings we have as Christians is we get to give love to others in that way. It's something that we give. It's the opposite of selfishness. Jesus told us in John 15, 13, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. You know, while this was not Jesus' main point here in the context of this passage, I can't help but pull some biblical applications from this. For those we love, we ought to lose our ego. For those we love, we ought to die to self. We ought to lay down our lives for those that we love. We ought to give up the part of us that says, I'm not going to love you because you're this way when it could take just some, some, some grace towards them and say that I don't need to hang on to this piece of me that says you've got to be that way. I mean, of course, there's, there's different scenarios that walk through there. I'm not saying this is just a blanket statement. But the undergirding principle behind all this, we ought to lose this. We ought to lay ourselves down. We must die to self in order to love rightly. Do you know the opposite of love isn't actually hate? It's selfishness. The opposite of love is not hate, it's selfishness. It's looking only to self. And Philippians chapter 2 warns us against that. It says, Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. Now, I don't know what you think of yourself right now, but I think you think you're pretty significant. I don't mean in an arrogant way or like you think you're better than everyone. You want to be first in line at the dinner. You want your needs met before anything else. You want to go do what you want to do. When you're in a group of people, you're talking about where should you go hang out? You want to go where you want to hang out. We are very self-focused, and that's just the way we are. And that's why some of this, especially as we talk about love, must be pushed to the side. We've got to get rid of our ego. It's not about us. You know, when we give in love that way, we often find the right love in return. We set that right stage there. We go with the right heart behind it. Things transform. So we don't want to be jealous. We don't want to have our ego in here. Here's another one I tell you. This is, this is a, a hard one for a lot of people to get past. A lot is uh, we want to grow in our love. We need to forget past wrongs. We need to let those things go that were in the past. It's not resentful, it says. We don't hold a grudge against those. Now listen, I don't mean that if someone has hurt you drastically that you let them back into your life to hurt you again. But you don't hang on to the anger that goes along with that. You don't hang on to the hate that goes on. That we, we let what has happened be in the past, especially when it is someone that we love. With people that we love, we know we've got to assume positive intent. When someone says something that I know who loves me dearly, but they say something that offends me, I shouldn't immediately get mad. I should say, that person loves me. They did not come at me with that intent to cause the harm. And just as they've done that in the past, they've possibly done that in the past, I want to let go of those things. Wise people look past wrongs and forgive offenses. That's what Proverbs says. Proverbs 19.11, Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it to his glory that he would overlook an offense. 
Imagine the grace. Imagine the restoration that could happen right off the bat if someone wronged you and because you loved them, you would say, let's walk through this. I forgive you. Let's move on. I know that's not that's case specific, but in general, let's move past this offense. I don't care if that happened. You, you wrong me, I'll eventually wrong you. I don't intend to do that. Let's work together. Let's grow in this. Let's get rid of our ego. Let's get rid of jealousy. Let's lay ourselves down. Let's die to self. And to the glory of God and to the benefit of the relationship, let's let those past wrongs go. Forgiving the past means you're willing to let something negative that happened be pushed to the side for the relationship. This kind of this thing it coincides with pride and arrogance. There's a lot of people that would say, you know, you may have done this and so I'm out of here. I'm not going to let this happen anymore. I'm just going to walk away. You've offended me in this way and I'm going to be gone. How many relationships have been destroyed from the pride of a person who wouldn't let a past wrong go? Or someone who hung on to something that didn't necessarily matter, but just because it wasn't discussed. Church, we've got to lose our ego. We've got to lose our pride. We've got to die to ourselves if we're going to love rightly. And we've got to forget past wrongs. You know, some of you right now, watching this, maybe in a relationship, very specific, you're in this relationship you're in right now because of a past hurt or wrong. Maybe you are not around a certain kind of person because of what that person did before. Maybe you're around someone who you think is safer than the last person. I don't know what's, what's going on there. That, that, I know that's a hard thing to take in. I trust that God can heal it and for the benefit of yourself, for the church, for your relationships. It behooves us. It's beneficial to us to forget those past wrongs. Stop hanging on to those things, church. Like, and I don't mean let other people who people have hurt you in the past, you don't have to let them back in your life to cause that pain again. But the hurt and the resentment that you hang on to is doing nothing but causing a cancer to you. Let it go. It's hindering the love that you could be giving to others and the love that you might not be willing to or be able to receive right now because of that hardness in your heart. Let that go, church. Let it go. Another thing we've got to do if we're going to grow in love is we've got to refuse to hurt. You know what I mean by that is don't cause harm to others. It doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing. It doesn't rejoice in evil. So we're going to go the opposite way. We're going to make sure that we're not going anywhere near that. Love does not take pleasure in causing any kind of hurt. Love does not take pleasure in ruling over another person, being domineering over another person. Love does not take pleasure in causing any kind of hurt. Now I've met Plenty of people in relationships, you, you probably know someone too, where one person is completely dominated by the other. And I don't mean necessarily like in, in abuse per se, but they go on power trips and they'll say things like, you don't love me if you do this, or you're only going to love me if such and such happens, or you've got to act this way. That's not love. That's not love. There's certain, there's got to be regulations and there's, there's, there's criteria for how we interact in our relationships, but love is not domineering. Love does not rejoice in those things. It does not uh, take joy in the other person hurting That's not love. That is not love. That's why we just read, love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. Selfishness is one of the biggest ways we can hurt others. Love is not selfish. Love is generous. Love refuses to cause hurt. Love refuses to rejoice in evil. Love refuses to take bad things in another person's life and take excitement from it. If that's what you're doing, if you're married to someone right now and you think, oh man, I'm so glad that person got told off at their work. I'm so glad that so-and-so is not having a good day right now. That's one of the most worst things you could ever do in your relationship. Maybe I, I get to be the Holy Spirit for you today to say, if that's what you're doing, that's ridiculous and you need to knock it off. I hope you hear that when I say things like that, church, that comes from love here, that my desire is to see you grow in your relationship with Christ. I want you to be strong in your marriages, strong in your relationship, strong with your kids, strong with your neighbors, strong with the gospel, strong with the church. But if you're doing things like that, that is toxic to you. It's toxic to the church. It's toxic to your family. It's toxic to Christ. It's toxic to the witness that we are supposed to carry. Of what we mentioned earlier where Jesus said, the world's going to know you're my disciple when you love. Selfishness does not take joy in that. Love lays down its life for friends. And the last one here, choose what you see. Choose what you see. Love bears all things. Love believes Loves, hopes for all things. What I mean when I say choose what you see, only look for the best. Only There's going to be bad. There's going to be bad. Of course, someone's going to come in with bad breath and try to give you a kiss in the morning if you're married. Get over it, right? Someone's going to come in and they're going to cause some kind of offense. Only look for the best. 
I don't mean like put on rose-colored glasses where we say, oh, everything's fine, nothing's wrong here. We address problems that are there. But we don't sit there and focus on them. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. You know, I, I don't know about you. If you pick out fruit at the store, I think of this as, as picking strawberries out of the store. When you walk through, you get a little carton of them right there. There's always a nasty one in there. But you don't chuck away the whole pack. There's always going to be something negative in there. I promise you, you're not the only one feeling this way. Your significant other, the person other on the other side of the relationship, feels the same way about you. <laughs> We can do wrong. There is no one who can do no wrong. We all need to grow. We all need grace. And church, one of the best ways we're going to see this happen is if we, the individual, you right here, listen to me. If we take the initiative, if we don't say, so-and-so has got to start doing that for me. No, no, no. We, you, I, we've got to start doing that ourselves. We take the initiative. We do those things. We don't nitpick and look at other relationships for our expectations. I mean, do you know how many different relationships have been ruined by watching sitcoms where this person set up this massive party for their best friend or someone who was able to, let's just take a spur of the moment trip to Paris and let's all fly off and spend $10,000 out of nowhere. That's a bad idea of love. That's an incorrect idea of love as the, as the norm, I should say. Love doesn't need all those other things in there. It's been said, you know, if you love your idea more of community more than you love community, you're going to kill them both. You can't love your idea of love more than you love the person. It's going to destroy. We, we look past. We, we believe all things. We bear all things. We hope all things. We stand strong in it. We don't nitpick other people in that. Of course, if we say, I would like to see you grow in this, and I would like to grow in that, of course we can do that. But we're not sitting there and picking apart people. Well, you don't do this. You don't do that. Maybe they don't. But man, we've got to grow in that. Humility is at the forefront of love, church. Humility is at the forefront of of love. His summation of this as he writes in this is says, uh, verse 14, no matter what comes, we should fight for love. That's the final point. And no matter what comes, we should fight for love. Verse 14 says that love endures what? Everything. Love endures all things. You know, it's almost as if to say, if I didn't explain it clear enough before, when I said that it bears, that it hopes, that it does all these things, if I wasn't clear, it stands strong. It endures. It hangs on. Even in the midst of all those other things, it stands strong here. It stays solid. Love looks for a way to make things work. Love looks for a way to make things right. Love does not find excuses. Love does not go up and grab other elements to try to push back another person. Love looks for the reconciliation. That's true in friendships. That's true in marriages. That's true in business relationships. It looks for that. It tries to find the peace that is there. Real love does not give up. I just read the story about an 80-year-old couple who had been married for 60 years, and when someone asked them, how have you lasted so long in marriage? How have you been able to do this? And the lady said, well, we came from a time where if something was broken, we fixed it. We didn't just throw it away. It's the same sentiment today, church. We don't throw away love. We don't abandon relationships right there. We walk into them and say, we're going to grow in this. We're going to love in this. Because of Christ, because Christ has shown me that kind of love. Can I not show that kind of love or try to do it? I've been showing so much grace in the sins and I have offended Christ. Can we, as people, not show grace to others? We have been forgiven of so much, church, through the work of Christ, through the love of God, to bring people into his family who do not deserve it. By his grace we are saved. By his great love and his mercy towards us are we saved. Man, what a blessing that is, church. You, know, you might be saying, Carl, we'll tell you what, patience is hard for me. Growing it, I agree. I gotta grow in patience. I've got to grow in letting go of my ego. I've got to grow in every single one of these. Don't please don't ever think that Carl walked up here to say, Man, I know everything about love. I, I'm the authority. I, I am not church. I'm the one who learned it this week before I got to tell it to you. And things I've got to constantly grow in as well. So if you say this is hard, you're right. It absolutely is hard. It's difficult, which is why our very last thing to look at here before we wrap up. Let the Holy Spirit do the work because you can't do the work. You can't just turn off impatience. You can't just turn off your ego. You can work towards it. You can take steps right here, right now when the service is over. You can absolutely take steps in that right direction, but you're not going to just turn it off like flipping a switch. It takes the Holy Spirit doing the work in us. Jesus' model of love is a fantastic model. It's the model. It's the goal. But realistically, it's hard because we're selfish jerks sometimes, aren't we? We are selfish jerks sometimes. If you read through the Bible, you know, you'd see that the fruit of the Spirit is things that produces in the life of the believer. 
Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Every single one of these has some attribute, element, connection to love. The very first thing that we see naturally, organically coming out in the life of a believer is love. So church, everything I've said today, you should practice patience. You should pursue reconciliation. You should get rid of your ego. We should bail on jealousy. We should bear, endure, love, hope all things. Absolutely. But the only way we can do that is by letting the Holy Spirit begin to work that in us. Do you know that we're promised that we can do that? 2 Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and to godliness. And that means it means God has given us everything we need to live in this life and to practice the holy living He's done through His Holy Spirit. That means we're absolutely out of excuses in every single thing. Can you love? Absolutely. Why? Because He's given us everything that pertains to life and to godliness. Can I, can I love my spouse? Absolutely. Can I, can I get rid of an addiction or this drug use? Absolutely. Can I overcome this lust, this pornography? Absolutely you can. Can I grow in faith? Can I grow? Absolutely you can. Because His divine power has given us everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness. That's, that's nine different ways we can look at today. And I hope that you would take all of them. But I want you to, just as we end here, the application point to start with is which one of those grabs your heart right away? Which one you say, oh man, you just knew. God's talking to me through that sermon today. God's talking to me through that word today. Jealousy, boom, it just hit me. Ego, that's what it was. I don't know what it was for you. Patience is what it was for me, if we're being honest. I need to grow in my patience. I'm, I'm so quick, I'm so busy, I so run around so many different things. I need to just slow down a bit and remember that grace and love is often shown in patience. That's my conviction, church. I'm trying to work on all these. I'm right there with you trying to grow in all of it. Which one of those hit you today? Can I, can I ask you to, let's take a leap of faith in that and say, if that's the one that came to mind, that's the one we ought to work on right away. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Let's ask God to enable us to do that. Let's pray. Let's commit these things to him today. Let's ask the Lord. Heavenly Father, we are blessed today to be able to celebrate a day of love, but to be able to know the source, the focus, and the, the goal of love is to be like you, and it's manifested solely through you. Jesus, we are so thankful that when you came into the world as God in the flesh, you also manifested love to us, that we might see all these things we've talked about today. Lord, as you ministered and as you healed and you cared and as you taught and as you told hard truths to people, all those things are elements we want to grow in, Father. We don't want to just do this as the Christian thing. We want to do this as something that would enable the Holy Spirit to transform our lives, Lord. May we be better in our relationships. Lord, I pray for everyone who's watching this right now. That God, they would have strong marriages and friendships and work relationships and connections with their kids and that you'd restore broken relationships that are there. That God, you would heal through the power of your Holy Spirit and through you giving us everything that we need for life and godliness, that love might be restored, that love might be shown, that love might be uh, manifested to people. And that Holy Spirit, you would guide us through all of it. Lord, we know because you've made such a clear point of it in your word to talk to us about love, that love is important to you. Lord, may we take these things so very seriously. Lord, I'm thankful that love is a great thing for us to walk in. I pray that we would walk in it rightly, that we would do it to the glory of your name and the benefit of those around us. We ask humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, church, you probably noticed we changed up our service format a little bit today, so we're going to jump into a time of worship. If you've read through the scriptures before, maybe you noticed that in uh, Exodus, I think it is, where Moses brought the law down from the people, or from God to the people. He told them all the law, and their response was, we're going to do this, and then they worshiped. So that's what we're going to do. We've heard a good thing, a good word from the Lord today, so we're going to take some time, we're going to jump into worship right now. So join me in singing this next song.
Hey, Anchor Church. Thank you so much for joining us for this service today. I hope you took away some amazing truths from the scriptures that were preached today. But before you leave, take a moment and meditate on those scriptures that were preached today. And just consider the video that we're going to watch in closing. Hey, happy Valentine's Anchor Church. Thank you for tuning in with us. God bless you. Have a great week.